I did intend to pass out the notes or the outline for today, so, but if anyone's missed, there are extras over on the table. Um, and we're continuing, I know it's been a little while, I think it was uh, back in December that we started with our first message uh, dealing with our identity in Christ. And this is probably going to be an ongoing uh, subject for quite some time. There's just a lot. Um, I'd like to, I, I won't be exhaustive with it, but there's a lot of different issues that relate to this uh, identity in Christ that I'd like to deal with in the future still. And so we're going to kind of take it slowly, and and, um, and this is going to be a, a, something we may be speaking on uh, for quite some time. But by uh, way of review, the first lesson was largely an introduction. Um, we kind of talked about our identity, and we gave some definitions of our identity, um, and we'll kind of review those again. But one of the things I want to point out is this issue of our identity is central, and we're going to kind of reinforce this throughout, um, is central to how we behave, how we act. And it's a very important thing. And so when we, when we deal with the issues of, of sin, the sin that we deal with, or addictions, or bad habits, and all the things that we deal with, this this identity that we have in Christ is central to overcoming that. And as we go on, we'll find that that some of the 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 scriptures that deal with this identity in Christ are in the context of how we relate to sin. And so we're going to kind of show that connection, um, maybe brush on a little bit today, but. Uh, more detail later. <clears throat> but this, this identity involves with how we think. And so it, it, it is central to how we can lead a productive life for the Lord. <clears throat> so first of all, as a way of review, look at the definitions of identity, and there are several different definitions. And, and if you go to the dictionary, if you go to a... Um, more of an exhaustive dictionary, you're going to find multiple definitions. But I pulled out three that I want us to kind of be aware of as we talk about this. And we dealt with this last time, but we'll kind of review that. Number one is the idea of individuality. And that's typically what we think of when we talk about identity. And, and that's a very valid point. We, we each one individually come here with a different name, with a different look, a different appearance, different skill sets, different jobs, that all that plays into our individual identity. And that's fine. We understand that definition of identity. And, and what we're going to be talking about does not necessarily do away with that aspect of it. We're not doing away with our individuality when we talk about identity in Christ. But then we move on to definition number two, and that's the idea of oneness. So, and I, I kind of gave this, I gave a couple different examples maybe last time, but the idea of oneness has to do with, instead of individuality being different from something, you're one with something. And so as we think about scripturally, we can be identified with Adam. We were, all came from Adam. We're all sharing in Adam's uh, curse. Adam is under the penalty of death, and so are we. So there is a oneness we have with Adam. And as we think about those things, that also creates a oneness we have with each other because we share in some of those things. So we can identify with Adam because of the things that we share with him. We can identify with each other because of the things that we share with each other. So that's the idea of oneness. And then that, that is true with Christ also for those who are saved. And then number three is the idea of connection. And so here, it's the idea of something being a description being set forth, something spoken, and then somebody can make a connection because of that. So, so maybe I'll just throw this out there. Maybe the idea is that, well, Christians 
are forgiving people. Because in contrast to much of the other religions out there, Christians understand the concept of forgiveness. And so maybe the statement, the description is given that Christians are forgiving people. And so then someone you know, comes along never having met Christians, sees firsthand how a Christian deals with someone who has wronged them. And maybe they've never seen that before. And so they make a connection. Well, this person must be a Christian because they fit what I've been told about a Christian. And so that's the idea of connection. And so we're kind of going to be, um, be thinking about the definitions number two and three here as we move on into these, this series with our identity. <clears throat> and so then last time we kind of ended up with the question, why do we as Christians fail so often to walk in newness of life? And I kind of put forth that the, the perception of ourselves is what drives our actions, but the problem is our perception of reality is flawed. It is limited. And maybe it isn't always flawed, but it is always limited. And so we have a flawed view of reality many times, and so we, we ask the question, what is more trustworthy? What's a more trustworthy view of reality? Is it our view or is it God's view? And the answer should be obvious. We can't see the big picture. We can't see the end from the beginning. But God does. And so many times we're we're stuck in this rut and and maybe some bad thing happens. And and I think a couple weeks ago uh, when Don was in uh, uh, Philippians, first chapter of Philippians, he mentioned the things, uh, uh, how Paul was put into prison. And it looked like a bad thing. It looked like the ministry of Paul was stopped cold in its tracks. And Paul could have just sat there in despair, thinking, Lord, why did this happen? I'm, I'm stuck here. I'm supposed to be your apostle out preaching to the Gentiles, and I'm locked up. But he goes on to say in Philippians, he says, these things, he says, my bonds have actually fallen out or have fallen to the furtherance of the gospel. Because Paul didn't quit ministering. And he realized that God had a purpose for him right there in prison. And he was furthering the gospel right there in prison. So that's just a, a quick example how, from a human perspective, we can look at things and we can be in despair and discouraged when really we're not looking at the big picture. We're not seeing the end. And God can work all these things together for good to them that love Him and are called according to His purpose. So we want to keep those things in mind. So that's why we need to always bring our minds and our thinking and our view of reality back to the Word of God. Because God sees the big picture. He's weaving everything together in in life if we're yielded to Him for His good and His purpose. And that's actually, that's really the goal we should have in life is to live a life of honor, doing the will of God, furthering His purpose here on earth. And He's not limited in in using us in that way by our circumstances. So we're going to back up now just a little bit. As we think about our identity in Christ, a lot of times we are flawed in our thinking with that because we have a flawed a, a, a view of who people are in Adam. And so for a little bit this morning, we want to back up and look about what does God say about who we are. And prior to being saved is really where I'm going to start out. Prior to being saved, we are identified with Adam. And I think last time we read the verse there in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We won't turn there. But in verse uh, 22, it says, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And so right there is just a real clear verse where God just sees two groups of people. And, And really, it's ultimately two men. And you're either identified with the one man or you're identified with the other man. And so that's 
That's really where we want to start out. We have to understand that God identifies us with Adam. So point number one is that we were separated from the life of God and under the penalty of death because Adam was. Adam, because of his sin, became separated from the life of God and he was under the penalty of death. And I think we're all aware of that, but we can turn to Romans chapter 5. And there's a few verses here that kind of give a description of what we were in Adam. This is a description of the type of people who Christ came to save. We'll start in Romans chapter 5, verse 6. And I guess we'll just read down through uh, verse 10. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And so here we find several different conditions that we were in. People in Adam find themselves in these conditions And these are the people that Christ died for. Verse 6, it says we were without strength. When we were without strength, and then later on in the verse, Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 8, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 10, for when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. And so here we see that Christ didn't come to die for those who were strong. He didn't come to die for the godly. He didn't come to die for the righteous. He didn't come to die for those people because He he came to die for those who were without strength, those who were ungodly, those who are sinners, even those who are His enemies. And that's the condition of everyone in Adam. And, and that's important because you know, this is not a, a, a very pretty description here. It's not very attractive to think about that. And that's a problem for a lot of people. Because when we think about this, we want to get our thinking straight. Are we without strength? Are we ungodly and, we are uns- and we're sinners? Do we find ourselves accumulating those conditions as we grow older in life and then we realize this is causing me to be separated from God? So I need to get my act together. I need to be strong. I need to become more godly. I need to quit sinning so that I can be connected to God. Do you see how the religious man thinks? That is religious thinking. And it's prevalent throughout humanity. But that's not the order. We need to understand that we were separated from the life of God. God sees us in Adam under the curse, under the penalty of death, and that's what drives us to be without strength. That's why we're without strength. We weren't designed to be strong apart from God. That's what causes us to be ungodly. That's what drives us into sin. We are sinners because we are separated from the life of God. And then as we walk that way, you know, this is kind of an interesting concept. We're going to dive into it. It's a whole subject of itself. As we walk that way, we become enemies of God. Now, I don't believe that a child, a young child, under the age of accountability is an enemy of God. But he is without strength. He is ungodly. He is a sinner, he or she. But as they grow old enough to be accountable before God and they reject the gospel of God, they reject God's offer of help out of that condition, they become an enemy of God by walking in that way. They become opposed to God's method of saving them out of that condition. So we want to remember that. Now the 
the, the religious thinking gets that backwards. And so then they get it backwards when they, when they think about their identity in Christ. If they're an unsaved person, yet they're, they're a church-going, uh, a Bible-reading, religious person, many times they'll have a completely flawed view of what it means to have an identity in Christ. Because their identity is based on reversing this order. They've got to get strong. They've got to become godly. They've got to become righteous. And so they set up rules. And we may talk about this perhaps, maybe rules for themselves to stop the sin. Uh, maybe the church will set up rules and guidelines to suppress the sin. And that's not God's method. It doesn't work. Here, see, here's the problem. They can suppress some sin. They can, they can stop sinning in certain situations. But that kind of life does not produce righteousness. It doesn't. And that's what God's after. God's not just after stopping the sin. He's, he's, His method here has a way of producing righteousness in you and I. The religious method can't do that. It does not do that. You can appear like you're doing the right thing because you're stopping the sin, but that's not producing the righteousness that God's asking for. That's not producing the righteousness of Christ in your life. You know, you can... Let's just think about this. There is a, a whole community of people out here east of town that have stopped sinning. They don't sin. But that is not enough. They're all dead. It's that cemetery out there. It's not enough to stop sinning. That does not fix their condition. See, the, the, the issue is they are, they're not producing righteousness, not at all. They have ceased life in this physical existence. And their body is laying there in the grave. But their body's not sinning. But that's not all God's after. This method of understanding our identity in Christ is what reorients our thinking, understanding who we are because of what Christ has done, and allowing that to work out of us. The, the primary issue is not then just stopping sinning. Yes, we, there are things and there are scriptural answers to how we deal with sin. We're going to deal with that. But that's only a means to a further goal, which is producing righteousness in our life to fulfill God's purpose for us here on earth. To walk according to His will. To bring Him honor and glory. <clears throat> but Now point number two. In Adam, we were dead in sins. So not only were we separated from the life of God and under the penalty of death, we are dead in sins. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is a, a real clear verse on this. Five fourteen says, For the, the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then we're all dead. So the, the assumption here is, if Christ died for everyone, that of necessity means everyone was dead. Everyone was dead in Adam. And so the dead here does not mean that they don't physically exist, they can't physically move. The deadness is that separation from God. We have the subject of we have the penalty of death upon us, but the difference here in point number two is it's not just separated from God. We are dead in sins. Look at look at Ephesians chapter two. Ephesians chapter two verse one, it says, "And you hath he quickened." That means to give life. To you hath he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. See, that's a problem. For every person in Adam, that is a problem. Because there, there is a God, and He is holy and righteous, and by His own character, in His own moral code, He must judge sin. He must. If He's going to maintain His righteousness, there has to be a point in time where He deals with sin. 
So for people in Adam who are dead in their trespasses and sins, and I like that description, it's not just, it's not just that sin is in us. We are in the sins. It's, I, I like that description. Think about that. It's like we are drowning. We are immersed. We are buried in sins. Dead in trespasses and sins. That's the description here. And so that is a problem for us. For, uh, number, point number three. We were also subject to wrath. And if we read on here in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, "...wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath even as others." So as people walk this way, as they, as they reject the solution that God has for this, they become His enemies and they become under His wrath. As it, goes, it deals with this in Romans chapter 1 and 2 somewhat, it talks about those who are impenitent, those who continue to reject God are treasuring up unto themselves wrath against the day of wrath. Now that's who people are in Adam. And furthermore, as we think about that, an unsaved person finds their identity through their physical existence in the flesh. They're born in Adam's likeness, and we were all there. We were born in Adam's likeness. We live independent of God. We behave in sinful ways, and therefore, by course of action, we are subject to God's wrath. <clears throat> now, that is a condition that, that grows stronger the older we get and the longer we walk that way. And we're conditioned all of our life. People who are in that condition are con conditioned from a young child to live life based on what they feel and see through their flesh. It's a physical, fleshly identity. <clears throat> and so then we want, to, um, we want to think about how that has to change, how our thinking in that regard and how we are programmed to deal with life in Adam, and how that needs to change and make the transition to understanding who we are in Christ the moment we're saved. And of course, that, that changes in a moment in time. When we believe the gospel, we believe that Christ is the one who offers the way out of this mess. And He died for my sin. So I'm no longer buried in these trespasses and sin. He bore them on the cross. And I trust Him to deal with that and that I can be right before God because of what Christ has done for me. The moment you believe that, your identity changes. God saves you. He gives you eternal life. He places you in Christ. He is no longer viewing you in Adam from that point forward. You are viewed in Christ. No matter how much sin you have in your life, no matter how you behave. Because that's not ultimately what separated you from God in the first place. And that's not what's going to be accountable to, to keep you in Christ. <clears throat> so the Bible has uh, much to say about this issue of identity. But it doesn't use that word. And so it uses a variety of things and concepts that are connected to it. And so we were going to look at some of those. But it does use one specific term that I think is nearly identical, very close to our word identity. 
And we're going to look at about three passages here to see that. Romans chapter 6. <clears throat> Romans chapter 6, verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. I want you to notice that old man. Because we're going to look at this. This old man that is crucified with Christ, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So here he's laying this out, and he's bringing in this concept of old man, and he doesn't specifically define what he's talking about here, but in the context of Romans, he's talking about our relationship to sin now that we are saved. And he's bringing this issue of old man, something we were. <clears throat> if we turn over to um, Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to find this term again. Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 22. Now will start in verse 21. If so be that you have heard Him, that's Christ, and have been taught by Him, as the truth is in Jesus, verse 22, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So here we have this concept again of old man and a new man. And the old man, we learn here, is corrupt. And the new man is righteous and holy. And so we, we find that that's, that's kind of fascinating. We need to learn some more about that. Because... We don't like to be described as corrupt. We want to be described as uh, righteous and holy. So we need to learn some more about that new man. In Colossians chapter 3, we're going to find it again. Colossians chapter 3, verse 9. Paul says, Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. And we know those deeds are corrupt. Verse 10, And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge, after the image of him that created him. And of course, that is the image of Christ. But one thing we can notice here, in this passage, he says, You've put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge. In other words, there has to be a renewing of what we know. We have to learn some new things, and we need to get some things in our thinking about this new man. Because it involves who we are in Christ. And it was the same idea back in Ephesians chapter 4. Because it says, Be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man. And so in both cases... There is a thinking, there is a mental refreshing going on in our mind regarding of who we were in the old man and who we are in the new man. <clears throat> and so we have basically three concepts here that we kind of need to sort out. And these are, these are things that took me some time, and it's not necessarily new, but years ago, trying to, fix, trying to sort this out. And I'll just offer my view and my um, definitions from a biblical perspective. And, and I'm not saying I've got it all 100% right. And, and maybe you'd like to see some things tweaked or whatever. I'm fine with that. But I saw three different terms that I needed to define because I knew they couldn't be 100% interchangeable. And that's the old man or new man, the flesh, and our body. And I was very fascinated. Is there a difference between those? And I believe there is. Otherwise, the Scripture could have just stuck with one of those terms. <clears throat> and so my simple, simplified view of these 
And, and they can be more complex in certain situations than this, but I've tried to make it real simple for us to get a clearer grasp. But the old man or the new man is our person's identity in Adam or a person's identity in Christ. That's about as simple as it gets. The old man is who you are in Adam. The new man is who you are in Christ. <clears throat> now we have number two is, is the flesh. And you, if you look at Scripture, there are times when flesh and body can be interchangeable. And if you go back, especially in the Old Testament, it will talk about a man's flesh or an animal's flesh, and it's clearly speaking nothing more than just the physical body. But I believe as Paul deals with it, as he deals with it from a doctrinal standpoint, in dealing with us, there is a slight distinction. And so I believe a, a, a person's flesh is a person's physical body, but along with the appetites and desires that are independent from God, that are operating independently from God. That's who everyone is in Adam. They have a physical body, and they've got desires and, and appetites and lust and things regarding that body that they are acting on and operating on apart from God. And then thirdly, the body, that's just the physical frame. And so you see there's a connection here. You've got the... Um, well, and maybe I could even draw it out on the board. I'm not very good with diagrams, but... You've got your physical body, and that's your outer shell. That's what people see. And then within that, you have your soul. And then in, inside that, you have your spirit. <clears throat> and so your, your body is just your physical shell. When people die, people that are in the, in the cemetery... That's just a physical shell. And so we all understand that, but your, your flesh is a little more comprehensive than that. It's your physical body and how it interacts with the world, what your desires are. It's, it's the temptations that come along with that body. If you think about it, there, when, when you leave your physical body in death, there's going to be some some appetites and desires and, and lust and, and whatever else, some sinful, not some not sinful. But those are going to go with the body. So the, the flesh is kind of how we relate in this body, how we relate to the body. <clears throat> and then your soul and your spirit, that is the inner man. So there could actually be, because the Bible talks about that too, we could put a double line around there. This is our outer man, the soul and the spirit is our inner man. The Bible talks about that too. But an unsaved person, they have all this external force of the world coming at them. And we see it through our body. We have the five senses. That's how we interact with the world. And so as that takes place, and then we have the body itself with desires, temptations, and it talks about the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. That is all in how we were relating in this body. And so we have these forces, and then the force of the body, and that is an overpowering force driving our inner man. And that's how we relate with the world. Now, when we come to it, th this, is, this is in Adam. Now, if we look at Christ and in who we are in Christ, we basically have the same thing. Body, soul, and spirit. The only thing is here now we have the Holy Spirit. And, we, and, and along with that is the life of Christ. We have eternal life now. And so we've got a different driving force now we've got a, a force within within the inner man. And there's a whole 
There's a whole thing. Um, we're going to deal with this more detail later. There's a whole newness that has taken place in the inner man. God has changed a lot. Christ has, has changed a lot of things in our inner man. So now the, the driving force affecting our life is not the outside world. It's the inner man. And that affects our body, which in turn affects how we interact with the world. And so now, instead of being under dominion of the course of this world, walking according to the prince of the power of the air, as the children of disobedience, being overcome with the, with the physical existence in the flesh, and that being um, the controlling factor in our life, identifying who we are, what we do, what we say, who we interact with. You know, religion likes to dress that up and try to change that, but it's still true for a, a very religious person as long as they're in Adam. But those in Christ have reversed that. Now they have a power source within. So now the world and the flesh no longer have absolute control over the inner man. <clears throat> so we're going to explore uh, some of that in more detail as we go along. <clears throat> but I think that illustrates, at least for now, the difference between the old man and the new man. And again, our perception of that, of our identity, has a significant impact on our behavior. And so, and, and this is something that we really have to, um, we have to fight against the thinking of the world in order to arrive at, at some of these right conclusions. You know, who of us doesn't want to change our behavior? Who of us, you know, don't have certain sins that are not fun. They're not, it's not enjoyable to hide sin. And it's frustrating when we, when we hurt others because of our um, weakness, because of our sin. We hurt others and relationships are broken or whatever. That's frustrating. And we have to pay the price for that. And, and, and all of us like the emotions that accompany right actions when we do good things. We like that. We get a good feeling from that. And we don't like it. Who, who of us enjoys guilt? Nobody enjoys guilt. Even, even bad people. I mean, those who are um, openly committed to doing evil, they don't enjoy the guilt. And so we despise the guilt of wrongdoing. And the, but here's the thing. Our success is not in focusing on our behavior, but in understanding our identity. And it's just like the, the example I gave of, of, of dead people out there stopping sin. You know, the, the Pharisee, uh, in, in Bible times, or the religious person today, they still have that wrong mindset where I'm going to try to control things. I'm going to, yes, this world is, is pressing in. I'm going to build some, some rules and some walls around there, and, and I'm going to try to control this flesh and, and try to make it better and try not to let it be so dominant over my soul and spirit, and it doesn't work. Oh, they might be able to break some bad habits. They might be able to, to shake the addiction. But they cannot produce righteousness. They cannot. <clears throat> so in closing, I want to give a little illustration. And, and, and the illustration itself is not original with me, but I changed some names and I changed a few details to maybe more effectively... Uh, illustrate my whole point here so far today. 
And just so I don't miss out too many details, I'm going to read it. But I just chose the names Jack and Jill. And so Jack and Jill are typical college kids. And and here's Jack's view of himself. Jack sees himself as a skin-wrapped package of salivary glands, taste buds, and hormones. Typical college kid. All of which are meant to be satisfied on a regular basis. He pursues anything that satisfies his flesh. Food, alcohol, and girls. He drinks all the alcohol he can, eats anything that tastes good, regardless of nutrition, and he pursues girls. But he especially has his his eye on one girl, Jill, a cheerleader who is pretty and flirtatious and takes all the attention that she can get. But one day, the track coach sees Jack running, and and it's when Jack is running after a girl, and he stops him. He says, hey, he says, you look very athletic, and you're very fast. You need to try out for the track team. And so he convinces Jack, and, and Jack joins the team and finds out that he is indeed a very good runner. So he begins to train regularly. He quits drinking. He begins to eat healthy, nutritious meals. And he practices and trains regularly. <clears throat> After several weeks, he has won some races and he's really getting excited about his new success. So he enters a, a statewide competition, a statewide tournament, and just before the big race, Jill shows up. She is dressed sensually and has a large ice cream cone in her hand and tells Jack, if you'll join me, you can have this ice cream cone and me also. And Jack emphatically shakes his head. And Jill's disappointed and confused because Jack has never turned down her invitation before. And she asks Jack, why not? And he responds, I am a runner, Jill, and I have a race today. You see what had changed? Jack's identity had changed. And here's the thing. Jack wasn't out here... This is what I want to drive home. Jack was not out here thinking, okay, I'm going to try out for this track team and just give it a try. And I don't know, I'm a little apprehensive about it. And as he goes along in in a couple weeks, he's like, man, I hate eating these carrots and the the salad. And I'll just sneak in some candy bars here and there. And I sure like to party, but uh, since I've got a track meet tomorrow, instead of partying all night, I'll just party till 11 and, and get home early. And he's not fighting this over and over. It's not a battle of his will to try to subdue his urges and to bring his life in line. And I'm not saying there isn't a place for willpower. There is, but that's not the primary battle going on in Jack's mind. It's not, the primary issue is not willpower to try to change his lifestyle. Jack sees himself as a runner. He loves being a runner. And if he's going to be a runner, then his goal is to do everything that benefits him to be a runner. And so when when the temptation comes along, that is sacrificing his identity as a runner, it's not this battle, oh, oh, let's see, okay, let's work this out. Hey, um, right now I've got to do this, but can we, can we schedule a different time? No, he's moved on because his thinking, his view of himself has changed. He no longer views himself as that teenage-driven, you know, fleshly way of thinking. And so that's, that's really the power. That's the power demonstrated in a changed identity. <clears throat> and 
And really, that's what we want to, to get at later on. We've got, we've got different things to think about. We want to talk about renewing our mind. We want to t- talk about what's taken place in the inner man that God has changed. And ultimately, that helps us overcome sin. As in Romans 6, it deals with the idea of our old man being crucified. And in the context, that's explaining how we should relate to sin now. And then ultimately, this leads to a productive, fruitful life for God. And so that's kind of some of the areas that we're going to be heading in in the future. But with that, we'll close, and if there's any uh, word or comment, we'll feel free. <clears throat> if not, let's uh, close with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this time, again, of uh, fellowship in Your Word. And Father, we pray that our, re- our minds would be refreshed and renewed as we study Your Word, and we, we readily recognize the errors of the world's thinking and how it impacts us daily. And so, Father, we want to resist that. We want to uh, fight against the worldly thinking that creeps into us, and, and we want to renew our minds continually in the Scriptures and help us to do that on a daily basis. So, Father, we pray that you would give us clarity and wisdom and lighten the eyes of our understanding that we might see these things more clearly. And so, Father, we rejoice in what Christ has done for us. We rejoice in the forgiveness of sins and that we have His righteousness placed upon us and all the things that we have in Christ that can bring forth fruit to Your honor and to Your glory. We thank You for these things in Christ's name. Amen.